ومن أحسن قولا ممن دعا إلى الله وعمل صالحا وقال إنني من المسلمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولهما بعد Welcome to another uh, Q&A on Tuesdays with our Q&A. And as usual, uh, the email address you should all be aware of, askyq at epicmasjid.org. And once again, I reiterate that I am only able to select questions of a generic nature that are going to benefit larger groups of people. Unfortunately, I'm unable to answer individual questions. Please understand uh, there's too many questions to do that. So please try to make your questions as pertinent to larger groups of people as uh, possible. So we begin today. Our first question, Sister Sumaira from India, uh, emails, uh, mashallah, tabarakallah, we have a lot of large viewership in India. Uh, and Sister Sumaira says, she asks that she has seen a clip p posted by an anti-Muslim uh, website or Facebook page in which they have a Muslim preacher in English uh, saying that the one who abandons salah, one salah, is worse, is a worse crime than uh, the one who murders and the one who rapes and the one who steals and the one who sells drugs, etc. etc. Et and uh, she says they are using this clip to show uh, that Muslims are fanatical and that a murderer is considered better uh, than the one who misses even one uh, salah. So she says this clip has flustered her. She wants to know, uh, is this what Islam says? Is this the, the opinion that uh, uh, is the correct one? Or if I have any comments about this notion of salah, uh, you know, uh, the one who doesn't pray being worse than the murderer. Uh, so dear sister Sumaira, this is actually a very uh, multi-layered question. It's actually, um, uh, it will take a while to, to, to unpack. Uh, but I want to begin by stating that you shouldn't be surprised that anti-Muslim websites and Facebook pages, they take such clips and they make them uh, viral. Uh, you know, the, the fact of the matter is that, uh, you know, these types of, of, of entities and groups, uh, they commonly do this. They go to clerics or they go to uh, people, even I myself have been the target of a number of such campaigns where they take a clip maybe out of context or other evil intent, and they then uh, portray something that perhaps even the speaker did not uh, intend. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself points out that in the Quran that uh, other faith groups or other you know uh, evil intended people al -kalima amma they distort uh, the message and the words in a context that uh, wasn't intended and this is a reality and a tactic that should never we should never do uh, we should always be faithful to the person who's speaking and make sure that this is what they actually um, intended now again as I answer this question uh, I am I'm not, um, you know, I don't know the, the, the preacher you're referring to. I don't know uh, the context he said it in. So I'm speaking uh, generically. I'm taking at your face value that there was a Muslim preacher who uh, said that uh, leaving the prayer is worse than murder and rape and, and stealing and drug dealing and all that. So I'm taking this at face value. And we're not um, uh, questioning the sincerity of uh, the person who said this uh, because sometimes a preacher uh, might encourage something to his private audience and perhaps he says it in a forceful manner that he thinks will work in that audience but you know these days with cell phones or video or whatnot it's so easy to take that clip out of context to broadcast it to an entire uh, globe and to make it sound just plain wrong and awkward and by the way this is a problem of social media we we, we see this happening all the time with famous people politicians Sometimes they say something they really shouldn't have said, but sometimes they say something in a context or, 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 or audience that might actually be effective in that audience. But not every speech is effective in every single audience. So uh, we have to also be a little bit careful here that, and, and, and especially myself, I'm very conscious of this, that sometimes I'm teaching a class to advanced students and I might say something to get a point across uh, or maybe you know preaching to a group of people that I know a certain language, a certain flowery language, might be effective, but it wouldn't be effective in another uh, audience. And we have to also be cognizant of the fact that 
we are, we are taught really to, to teach to people according to their level. So when I teach an advanced class of fiqh, I might say certain things that I would never say in the khutbah. Not that it contradicts, but there's a time and a place and a manner to do such teaching. So I, I, I say this because again, I want to be uh, you know, careful here that uh, we're not yani, uh, speaking against this, this preacher per se. I don't know though the context that he said it in, but I'm saying that perhaps this preacher himself didn't intend for his words to be broadcast in such a manner that even Islamophobes in India uh, would be trying to make a, a, an incorrect point uh, out of this. And I say this because frankly, even though I don't agree with the sentiment expressed by this speaker, I can understand where he's coming from and I can understand that he probably wanted to encourage the people in that audience to pray. And not that he was trivializing murder, but rather that he was encouraging prayer and he used a terminology or a language that he thought would be effective. But still, with all of these caveat and introduction. Let us get to uh, the, the crux of the matter, which your question is that, is it true that leaving the salah is worse than murder and, and rape and, and, and stealing and drugs and all of this? So we need to understand where this notion is coming from, where this claim that leaving the salah is worse than murder is coming from. The claim this, this phrase that the one who does not pray is worse than the murderer, this phrase does not occur in the Quran. It does not occur in the Sunnah. It does not occur upon the tongues of any of the Sahaba or Tabi'un or the early you know, Salaf or the scholars of this Ummah. It is not a phrase that is divinely revealed or divinely sanctioned. It is a derived phrase based upon a opinion that is a minority opinion in some legal and theological schools. So the phrase that the one who leaves the salah is worse than the murderer. Once again, it is not a Quran, it is not Sunnah, it is an extrapolation from an opinion, okay? And that opinion is a minority opinion in the grand scale of things, but it is a legitimate opinion. What is that opinion? That opinion is that, listen to this carefully, there is a minority opinion that the one who abandons the salah has committed a sin worse than any sin that you can do against a human being because they, the, the claim is or the opinion is the one who abandons the salah is not a Muslim, has committed kufr. Okay, so this is the opinion. Who said this opinion? The opinion was stated by Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal and it is generally speaking uh, predominant in the Hanbali school. The Shafi'is, the Hanafis, the Malikis, they do not agree with this uh, opinion. But Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal and uh, um, his later followers in particular, Ibn Taymiyyah ibn Al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, they were very uh, clear in this position of theirs that the one who abandons the prayer, that's called the Tariq Salah has committed kufr. And we know that kufr is a bigger sin than the sins against mankind, right? Shirk is the biggest sin in Islam. And so we know that kufr and shirk are the biggest sins. So if the one who has abandoned salah has committed kufr, then we can state or that group can state that abandoning the salah is worse than murder. And from this we can extrapolate, again this is like one plus one plus one, you keep on extrapolating, each one of these you have to you know go along. From this uh, somebody can claim that oh if you leave one prayer uh, you know this is uh, worse than murder. This is where it is uh, coming from. Now again to go back to the very beginning, there is a legitimate opinion that the one who abandons the salah has committed kufr. Now, this is not the Q&A right now to get into that controversy. I don't mind maybe another Q&A. Uh, I will go into this controversy uh, of the classical schools of law. Why did Imam Ahmed say this? And why did Ibn Taymiyyah say this? And why did Ibn Qayyim say this? Uh, and there have the evidences which, you know, from their perspective are very crystal clear. There's a hadith in Sahih Muslim uh, that uh, the treaty or the covenant that I have with my followers basically is the salah. Whoever abandons it has committed kufr. فَمَنْ تَرَكَهَا فَقَدْ كَفَرْ This is a prophetic uh, hadith. So Imam Ahad ibn Hanbal understood from this that the one who leaves salah, tariq salah is a kafir. Now this is the Hanbali position. Uh, by the way, interesting, there's um, a conversation reported in uh, as Subki's Tabaqat, the famous Shafi'i scholar, that it is said that Imam Ahmad and Imam Shafi'i were debating this issue. Imam Shafi'i uh, was the teacher of Imam Ahmad. Imam Ahmad studied from Shafi'i, so they knew each other for, for a number of years. So it is said that Imam Shafi'i asked Imam Ahmad 
Muhammad that do you say that the one who leaves the salah is a kafir? And Imam Ahmad said, yes, I do. So Imam Shafi'i said, okay, if he has left the salah, how does he re-enter Islam? How does he re-embrace the faith? So Imam Ahmad said, he must say, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah to re-enter into Islam. Imam Shafi'i said, but the man never abandoned La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah such that he has to reiterate it. The man never abandoned La ilaha illallah, he's believing La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah, he hasn't just prayed, he's, he simply hasn't prayed. So why should he repeat what he hasn't abandoned? So according to this conversation, uh, this uh, narration, Imam uh, Ahmad was silent and then he responded. So he must re-enter Islam by praying the Salah. That's how he's going to re-enter Islam because he has, uh, according to this opinion, left Islam. So how shall he re-enter? So uh, the first uh, the point was that he should say the kalima. Imam Shafi'i said, but he never abandoned the kalima. Why should he repeat it? So Imam Ahmad said, okay, he must pray. And that prayer will be considered to be re-entering Islam. So Imam Shafi'i said, but you are telling him to pray and you just called him a kafir. And the kafir's prayer is not accepted. So his prayer will not be accepted because he's a kafir. So how then do you expect him to re-embrace the faith. And so according to this anecdote, uh, uh, there was no response to this. So again, we have to take this with a grain of salt. This is coming from uh, a subki, and you know who a subki is and his, his bias. So we have to understand, yani, but still it's an interesting anecdote that demonstrates the philosophy of the one who abandons the prayer versus the one who doesn't abandon the prayer. Point being, Imam Shafi, Imam Malik, and Imam Abu Hanifa, they all said, the one who abandons the prayer out of laziness, has committed a sin, but he is not a kafir. He is a Muslim. And Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal said, the one who abandons the prayer uh, has left Islam. Now, as we said, since kufr is the worst sin and it is not forgivable, therefore, based on that, the one who abandons the salah has indeed committed a sin that is generically worse than other sins if you follow the Hanbali uh, school. Uh, however, there's a number of points that need to be mentioned here. Firstly, what does it mean to abandon the salah? Does it mean that you never pray at all? Or does it mean that you don't pray the majority? Or does it mean that you just don't pray one salah, which is apparently what the speaker said? Actually, if you read Ibn Qayyim ibn Taymiyyah and others, it seems very clear to me and Allah knows best that their opinion is not what this preacher said. That their opinion by abandoning the salah means the one who has left the salah in totality, the one who never prays at all in his life, the one who never does sajda ever. That is what they meant by tariku as salah, the one who has left and abandoned the salah. Nonetheless, it is true that very, very few voices, uh, even in modern times, they followed what I would call a very extreme position. And that is that the one who abandons one salah, the hadith and this ruling applies on him. This is a minority opinion within the minority opinion of the Hanbali school. Because the default of the, the, the madhab would be that the abandonment of salah is the, the total abandonment, the one who never prays whatsoever. So this is the first uh, issue we need to understand, that the Hanbali school is saying, the one who never prays ever in his whole life, that sin is bigger than the sin of anything against mankind. Secondly, and this is a key point that perhaps the speaker did not know or did not realize or did not express, whatever, but it wasn't said. The gravity of the sin, is different than the potential of forgiveness of the sin. And we need to differentiate between those two. Sins between man and Allah, no matter how grave and big they might be, also have the potential to be forgiven with ultimate ease. Allah forgives the biggest sins against Him for the one who repents. In contrast to this, sins between mankind even if small, might be extremely difficult to forgive if the other person does not forgive. So, to claim, even if one was Hanbali, even if one followed that minority opinion, to claim that uh, you know leaving the salah is worse than murder, in one aspect, the gravity of the sin, yes, they are correct. 
But in terms of forgiveness, no, that phrase is incorrect. Because the one who has committed a sin against Allah, all they need to do is to say Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. They, they, they repent, they have a, a nadama or regret in their heart. And if they are sincere, it shall be forgiven. I mean, how does a mushrik repent? By simply saying La ilaha illallah and all of that shirk is forgiven, right? As for the murderer, he can ask a thousand times, but if the family of the murdered and if the murdered person himself does not forgive him on the day of judgment, of what use is that, right? As for the one who has done backbiting, which is infinitely smaller than murder, right? If the one upon whom you, you have backbitten, he does not forgive you, how will you be forgiven? You must give him some good deeds. You must pay the penalty for that. So dear uh, sister, one needs to differentiate between the enormity of the sin and between the potential for forgiveness. And when you understand this point, then this phrase becomes incorrect according to the potential for forgiveness. And it might be correct according to the Hanbali school, according, uh, if you look at the enormity of the sin. So we have to be very, you know, uh, uh, cognizant of this distinction here. And I'd also, also like to point out, you know, and this is advice to me as well, because this has happened to me as well, that those who are, you know, preaching and teaching Islam, and that includes me, we need to be extra careful about uh, such evil people taking our 10 second clips and distorting them. We need to be very cognizant of what we're teaching and preaching. I mean, I have no doubt, inshallah, even I don't know uh, the brother or whatnot, but I have no doubt that this preacher who said this, you know, is following the Hanbali school, he's following the Hanbali position, he's read it in some books and he thinks this is the correct opinion. And that's his prerogative. I mean, it's a minority opinion, but it's his prerogative. I have no doubt that he intended good for his audience. He intended his audience to, to, to pray and that's a good thing. But given the world that we live in, uh, and given the, the you know, uh, 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 the reality of, you know, the internet and putting everything online and so easy, to misunderstand and to misread and to, to take out of context. Uh, I advise myself first and foremost, because again, as I said, this has happened to me multiple times, and all of us who are preaching and teaching, that we be extra careful and don't just give ammunition, you know, with no intention to do so to uh, Islamophobes. And again, it happens to the best of us. Uh, uh, and I speak as somebody who has thousands of videos online, Allah Azza knows how many times somebody has taken a 10 second, and sometimes I might actually make a mistake. I mean, I'm a human being. And sometimes I say something and it is interpreted in a different way. And sometimes the wording is inappropriate. So they take that 10 second and you know, a huge thing is is, is uh, raised over it. So we have to be careful, but no matter what we do, we cannot uh, guarantee. But still, these types of sentiments to say that the one who abandons one prayer is worse than the murderer. Yani, even if you follow this sentiment and follow the Hanbali school, I advise people who have such yani, um, you know, opinions and when that, that they should think about the repercussions of what is going to happen when uh, such an opinion is said and the da'wah of Islam yani, might be misunderstood in this regard. And if you hold such a position, then preach it in a manner that is wise. Preach it in a manner that is gonna contextualize and develop it. Like, you know, I have just explained that you can say the gravity of the sin is worse, but the potential for forgiveness is much easier because you cannot compare. I mean, you know, subhanAllah, the reality is that would you rather live next to a, a you know practicing Christian or a mass murderer? Which one would you live? Even though we know that shirk is worse than uh, uh, the sin of of, of you know uh, killing people, but still, yani, what would you in terms of psychology, in terms of society, in terms of civil duty and whatnot? Would you rather live next to a mass murderer or next to a church going Christian? How can you compare the two? So the sin in the eyes of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is one thing, and the potential for forgiveness and the evil factor in our own society is another thing. Allah Azza wa Jal explicitly allows uh, non-Muslims to live in a Muslim land and to practice their faith. And we are not allowed to, you know, give shelter to murderers and criminals, right? Think about that. So we have to be a little bit careful in how we understand and, and phrase these things and uh, preach in, in the best of manner. So to, to conclude this question, the phrase abandoning the, the one who leaves one prayer is worse than the murder. This phrase is not Quranic. It is not prophetic. It is not a hadith. It is not a statement of a Sahabi. It's not a statement of uh, the early uh, Salaf of this Ummah. However, it is a derived phrase based upon a minority opinion in Islamic fiqh and Islamic uh, law. And even those scholars who held such an opinion 
uh, would perhaps not phrase it in the way that perhaps this preacher has phrased it without all of the necessary caveats and without explaining the context behind uh, you know uh, uh, such a phrase because it's so easy to be uh, misunderstood so Firstly, again, it is a minority opinion that the one who abandons the salah uh, uh, has committed kufr. Secondly, uh, the, the, the difference of what it means to abandon and the Hanbali position's default uh, ruling is that abandonment is total abandonment. Thirdly, we differentiate between the gravity of the sin and the potential for forgiveness and the disgust factor. The gravity for the Hanbalis might be more, uh, but not the potential for forgiveness. That is much less, it is much easier to be forgiven for a sin between you and Allah versus a sin between you and man. And also the disgust factor, the, the revolting factor. There is no question that the murderer, you know, you look at him in a way and the rapist and the whatnot and the pedophile and whatnot, that is the thing that brings about a, a level of, of, of intense disgust and anger. And yet Allah Azza wa Jal allows the Ahli Kitab and the Ahli Dhimma to, you know, uh, practice their faith in, the, in, in an Islamic land, in an ideal Islamic land. And of course we don't uh, morally agree, but they have the the legal right to do that. So that indicates that it's not the same level as these types of crimes and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, knows best. I hope that inshallah that answers your question. Our next question, brother Nasir from Malaysia uh, writes uh, that there was a, uh, he writes from a village in Malaysia that uh, recently there was a flood over there and it damaged uh, many properties in that village and the village has people of different backgrounds and different faiths and so the masjids and the temples were also damaged. He writes that as a gesture of goodwill the entire community got together to rebuild the city and as a part of that uh, people rebuilt the masjid and they rebuilt the temples as well. But some people objected that uh, the Muslims should not participate in rebuilding the temples uh, and so he asks me that is it allowed to uh, uh, for us to come together to rebuild the temples is this correct or not uh, firstly, I make dua that Allah eases your situation. No doubt that a flood is a very uh, traumatic experience and I'm happy that uh, you and your family were protected, it looks like, and alhamdulillah, yani life is much more important than property. And so alhamdulillah, yani the, uh, you know, you, you, Allah protected uh, all of you and your loved ones. And I pray that uh, your affairs are made easy for you. Now there is no question that living in peace and in harmony in civil society is definitely one of the admirable goals of the Sharia. Ah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to live lives that we're not constantly bickering and fighting. One of the biggest blessings that Allah gave the people of Mecca is that they don't have civil war. And Allah says in the Quran, If they desire peace, you as well desire peace. And the Treaty of Hudaybiyyah clearly demonstrates that, as the Prophet said, that whatever conditions they want that are allowed in the Sharia, I'm, I'm going to give it to them as long as the Haram, as long as the sanctity of Allah is respected. Whatever conditions that will bring about some type of, of peace, I will give it uh, to them. And there's no question as well that helping one another in general humanitarian causes is definitely allowed and encouraged, especially when we're living together, especially when there are kith and kin or our relatives or the same society. Allah says in the Quran, لا ينهاكم الله عن الذين لم يقاتلوكم في الدين ولم يخرجكم من ديالكم أن تبروهم وتقصطوا إليهم. That Allah Subhanahu wa Taala allows you. That Allah is not forbidding you against those who they're not hating you for your religion. They're not stopping you from practicing your faith. Allah says you may be good and kind and you may be just with them. أن تبروهم and بر is the highest level of kindness. وتقصطوا إليهم and that you deal with them in justice. And Allah loves those who are kind and those who are muhsin. So Allah loves the uh, muhsineen. And after the Treaty of Hudaybiyyah, one of the chieftains of Najd uh, was manhandled by the Quraysh uh, and he promised that he would not send any grain to them after that he had accepted Islam and uh, uh, they, they mistreated him. So he became angry, he goes, I'm not going to send any grain to you. So he blocked the grain from the people of Quraysh. This is when the Quraysh and the Muslims were at war with one another. The Quraysh begged the Prophet to intervene and to allow food to 
come to their children. Uh, and the Prophet wrote to the chieftain and said to him, allow the caravans to come. So here again, the Prophet is facilitating the food to go. And as well, in the uh, siege of At-Ta'if, in the siege of At-Ta'if, when the Muslims had surrounded, and this is war, and the Muslims had surrounded the city of At-Ta'if, and they were about to burn the date palms in order to you know, uh, expedite the siege. And the people of Ta'if begged them for the children that are gonna come afterwards, because when you destroy the date palms, you're, you're talking about another generation to have the dates come again, right? The date palms, once they're there, you can manage them. But if you destroy all of the date palms, you, you know, for, for you know, 20 years, 30 years, you're not gonna have any dates. So the people of Ta'if in the war, they begged the Prophet to look, we're at war, but at least leave the dates. Uh, don't don't destroy the the cultivational crops. And the Prophet sallallahu forbade the Muslims to do so. And this is again general humanitarian, like you're helping people to eat, to live, to live peaceful lives. And Allah says in the Quran, wa ta'awunu ala al-birri wa taqwa, help one another in piety and in good things. Wa la ta'awunu ala al-ithmi wal-udwan, do not help one another in evil deeds and in transgression. So. All of this is to indicate that the generic concept of being kind to everybody and of helping your neighbors of all faiths in rebuilding their residences, in feeding them, in providing shelter, in giving food, in supplies, in clothing, all of this is not just allowed, it is encouraged. We should and we are commanded to treat people with kindness and compassion, especially those that are, are treating us as well and we're living in a civil society. But let me ask you a question, dear brother. Would you help them by providing them beer and wine? Would you go so far as to say, okay, well, you know, I'm gonna go purchase beer for you and you know, I want you to feel comfortable. They should understand and you should understand that there are limits to cooperation. And these limits should be made clear and there should not be any haraj or harm, you know, any type of, of discomfort in explaining this. Anything that goes against our principles, we have to draw the line there. So we give them water, we don't give them wine. We give them barley, we don't give them beer. It's very simple, you know, we give them that which we think is pure and good. If I think that, you know, drugs is harmful, and I do think so, and they think that drugs is not harmful, and they want drugs, do, am I gonna give them drugs and say, oh, this is, you know, we're being kind and compassionate? No, I think it is harmful for them. I'm gonna say, no, okay, here's water, here's food, here's bread, here's shelter, here's, you know, anything you need, we're help. But you see this thing, I, I can't give you drugs, I can't give you alcohol, I cannot give you that which will, uh, harm you. And so we also believe that, you know, temples are that which, you know, we don't believe is morally uh, correct to worship other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we explain to them gently with wisdom, with kindness that, look, this is your right to have your other places of worship, your, ch your churches, your synagogues, all of this is, you know, your, your right to do. Uh, but obviously we, uh, you know, find this that we, we don't need to cooperate in this thing and neither are we asking you to cooperate in the masjid. We understand if you're uncomfortable helping us build our masjid. If they decide to do so, that's on them. But you know, you should make it clear that we understand that this is, you know, might be a sensitive matter for some amongst you and that's fine. We're not expecting you to go uh, uh, beyond that which is reasonable. Now I understand that in the world that we live in, some people will find this objectionable and they will say that, but this is, you know, uh, reciprocity, just like they've helped you, we should help them. And for those people, uh, you know, these are generally the, the more woke crowd, the more, you know, um, uh, the crowd who have their own principles and paradigms. I say to them, imagine uh, if uh, somebody who doesn't drink was forced to, to, to participate in building a pub, building a, you know, a, a winery. Would that be ethically permissible? Or let me put it in your language, perhaps this is not in your language. Imagine a people who were colonized and their land was plundered by an outside invading force. If in this reciprocity, they were asked to rebuild a statue to honor the colonizer. Right? Your paradigm is different than ours, I understand, so I'm speaking to you in your paradigm. So if, you, if we asked, you know, or, or even if we asked, you know, uh, people who might have been enslaved, you know, their ancestor might have been enslaved, if, if you know, the flood damaged the, the, uh, a monument built to one of the slave owners or right, in the past, or the house of the slave owner, would you expect the descendants of the slaved people, enslaved people to then rebuild the, the memorial of the uh, slave owner? You would say that is so unfair. 
you would say that's not appropriate. Why should the colonized people, you know, why should they be asked to honor? This isn't appropriate. They're being asked to honor the colonizer. They're being asked to develop or, or to build the statue or the museum, you know, of the colonizer. That's not, you know, there's enough zulm has happened. So we say, according to our paradigm, that we also think it is zulm, the greatest zulm to worship other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore, we as Muslims have our red lines. And we are very, very clear that we should be at the forefront to spread kindness and compassion and food and drink and you know shelter and blankets and anything of this nature. Build their houses and build anything that needs to be done and they'll build your houses. But places of worship becomes sensitive and we should be very clear that uh, we don't need to cooperate over there and neither do we expect it. We should also put this, look, no big deal. You know, we'll help each other in our community houses. Yes, we should, no problem there. But houses of worship and temples, uh, we do need to draw the line and say that that is not something that uh, we should do because that goes against what we consider to be ethical and moral, even as they have the right to do so. Again, just because they have the right doesn't mean we need to be at the forefront and we need to always have that healthy balance that we remain firm to our values without, you know, uh, um, uh, without causing any tension or, or, or problem in society. And if we do so, inshallah, you will find that the, the, the person of intelligence and, and dignity will actually respect you from where you're coming from and understand if you tell and explain in a manner that is conducive, inshallah, it will be something that they will understand and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Our uh, final question for today. Uh, sister emails from New Jersey. She wishes to remain anonymous for reasons you will see. And she says that someone has uh, wronged her, taken her rights, slandered her, and uh, uh, has made her feel extremely hurt and angry. And because of all of these transgressions, this sister has made dua against that person. She says that after a while, that person's spouse passed away. And the spouse had not done any wrong to the one making dua, but now she feels an immense amount of guilt that did my dua cause the death of the spouse of this person that I made dua against? And am I sinful in making dua against uh, this person? Is there any penalty that she has to do that she thinks that the death that happened might be uh, as a result of her prayer uh, uh, that she did? So, uh, dear sister, realize that uh, let's first talk about the dua of uh, the mazloom, the dua of the one upon whom wrong has been done. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim, beware of the prayer of the oppressed, for there is no barrier between it and Allah. فَإِنَّهَا لَيْسَ بَيْنَهَا وَبَيْنَ اللَّهِ حِجَابٍ There is no barrier, it's going to go straight to Allah Azza wa Jal. Beware of the prayer of the oppressed. And our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Three are the prayers, du'as, that shall be responded to without a doubt. Number one, the prayer of the father for his children. Number two, the prayer of the traveler. And number three, the prayer of the one who has been wronged. And that hadith is in Abu Dawud. And our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, three du'as are never returned. Number one, the just ruler. Number two, the one who's fasting until he breaks his fast. And number three, the one upon whom an injustice has been done. It is carried all the way to the clouds and the heavens open up for it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I swear by my honor and I swear by my glory, I shall help you, O one in distress, O one who has been wronged, even if it is after a while, but I shall help you. And hadith, this hadith is in Mustanima Muhammad. Now these a hadith and others, they tell us that the prayer of the one who has been wronged is always answered. This indicates there's nothing wrong with praying to Allah against the one who has wronged you. This is completely permissible. Otherwise, the Prophet would not have encouraged it. And this is in fact a manifestation of Allah's infinite justice. Allah does not allow injustice and Allah despises injustice. And where injustice occurs, then those upon whom injustice has been done, they have every single right to raise their hands to the King of Kings.
and they have every right to beseech the one who hears all and the one upon whom nothing is lost and to call out to Malik al-Mulk and to Rabb al-Samawat al sabah and the Rabb of the Arsh al -Azim, and to say, Ya Rabb, I have been wronged and no one can help me other than you. Ya Rabb, you are my Mawla. Ya Rabb, hasbi Allah wa ni'm al -wakil. Allah is sufficient for me. Ya Rabb, upon you is the one who is doing zulm, who is slandering me, who is lying about me, who is spreading evil and malicious, complete fabrications. Ya Rabb, you are the one who shall deal with them. You have every right, sister, to raise your hands to Allah against the one who has wronged you. Whether that wrong is financial, whether that wrong is emotional, whether that wrong is physical, any zulm that has been done against you, you have every right. Now, of course, you have the right to forgive, you have the right to, you have the right to go to court, you have the right to seek justice, and of the rights that you have, is the right to raise your hands up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ask Him to correct your wrong and ask Him to take care of the wrongdoer and ask Him to punish the one who has wronged you. Obviously a punishment that is commensurate to the wrong that has been done. You have every right. Now again, wrong has been done to you, you should not ask for more than what has happened to you. So you can ask Allah that, Oh Allah, I'll leave it to you to deal with my tyrant, with my zalim. I'll leave it to you to take care of my, uh, the one who has uh, harmed me. And your dua to Allah is completely permissible. Now, you you have to also separate that the, the uh, death of a person has nothing to do with your dua. Your dua will not change when that person's death has been destined. Death is something Allah has destined from above the seven heavens. It is written down, it is decreed, no matter what your dua is, it will not change the time of death of the other person. So let us separate. You are allowed to make dua against the one who has wronged you. You may ask Allah for your rights. You may ask Allah to punish that person. You may ask Allah to deal with him or her in a manner that is just, no problem. After this, what happens? And especially the death of another person, that's not on you. Clearly, this is something that is not relevant to your dua. The person's death or whatnot is not something you, you are liable for, much less you caused it. No, Allah is the one who decides when people pass away. No other person can influence that. And Allah Azza wa Jal will decide how to punish this person. So if that person was punished in this manner, which we don't know, that is something that Allah has decided to do. You are not liable. and. If this person, the spouse, was not guilty of anything, don't worry, there is not as if you are sinful. Allah will deal with them in a merciful manner and whatnot, and, and, and they, their time came when their time came. But you are reading in too much, and you do not know what punishment that Allah will prepare for the one who has done dhulm to you. So you leave that person's affair to Allah and you move on with your business and you will get your reward on the day of judgment. And in this world, if you don't get your justice, which hardly anybody does in this world, don't worry, put your trust in Allah. So the bottom line, and this with this inshallah we conclude, anybody upon whom dhulm has been done, injustice has been done, you have the ultimate right to raise your hands to Allah and ask Allah to deal with the perpetrators of injustice and make dua to Allah and Allah shall answer your dua. After that, what happens, it's not something you are liable for. And also you do not know, was it your dua that even suppose he was in an accident or something happened or uh, the business came down or whatever, you do not know was it really because of your dua or was it something else? And it's not as if you are liable because if your dua was answered, well then Allah Azza wa dealt with that person in a manner that was best befitting for that person. And if it was not answered, well then how do you know? So therefore, in either scenario, you have done your, your dua and you are not liable for what happens. There is no need to feel guilty. There is no need for any kafara in this regard, nothing of this nature. And you are not sinful in the slightest uh, to, uh, to make dua against the one who has wronged you. And this also should be a wake up call for any amongst us who is doing injustice to any other person. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, uh, injustice shall become darknesses on the day of judgment. And there is no sin that is more difficult to forgive than injustice. And our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, beware of 
hurting or harming any other person and the day of judgment will come and there will be no back and forth except with good deeds. So anybody who has done a wrong in this world should resolve it in this world before the next. Our Prophet said in the next world, there will be no money. There will only be good deeds that will be given and we don't want to give our good deeds to anybody else. So be careful, dear brother or sister, of doing dhulm to anybody and those upon whom injustices have been done, those whose reputations have been slandered, those whose feelings have been, uh, uh, those who have been, uh, um, uh, rights have been taken away. They have every right to ask Allah and Allah Azza wa Jal will indeed respond to the dua of the madhroom. And with that, inshallah ta'ala, we come to the conclusion of today's Q&A. Until next week, jazakumullah khair. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. وَاذْكُرُوا اللَّهَ فِي أَيَّامٍ مَعْدُودَاتٍ فَمَنْ تَعَجَّلَ فِي يَوْمَيْنِ فَلَا إِثْمَ عَلَيْهِ وَمَنْ تَأَخَّرَ فَلَا إِثْمَ عَلَيْهِ لِمَنِ اتَّقَى وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَاعْلَمُوا أنكم إليه تحشرون